So we have some great presenters today, um, and I'll share a little bit about the format and then I'll turn it over to our team of presenters. Um, the session today will run until 4.30 p.m. Uh, we are recording the session, as I mentioned, and it will be on our website in the near future. Uh, we have 10 presenters today, and we wanna make sure that we get to all of them. So we're going to hold all questions until after the presentations. Um, I believe many of the questions you may have will be answered in the course of the presentations. And so uh, the agenda is in the chat and around 4.15, uh, we'll plan to uh, turn it over to questions and answers. Uh, we will be distributing the schedule of future presentations in the upcoming week. Uh, the presentation next month will be on um, individualized home supports and assistive technology. And um, these forums are held on the Teams platform and it uh, are limited to 250 participants. And so uh, they're held on a first come first serve basis. Uh, and uh, we're at, uh, it looks like around 92 participants for this session. So that's great for our first uh, forum. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh Scalora from DDS, who's gonna talk a little bit about supported housing. All right, thanks so much, Elisa. And I'm going to turn my camera off and I will share my screen. I do have a few PowerPoint slides to share. And for folks that are uh, on the call and who do not have a um, uh, ability to view that, I apologize. And perhaps we can distribute afterwards so everyone can have the, the same opportunity there to to see that all right so here we go folks and let me know if you can see this and once i get an affirmative i'll be good to go we can see it all right great thanks so much here we go we're going to talk about supportive housing at dds and um, dds has uh, been fortunate to be invited to join the interagency committee on supportive housing around 2014 and through our membership on that committee the interagency committee on supportive housing which is made up of many health and human service organizations um, it's made up of the corporation for supportive housing the department of housing connecticut housing finance authority the office of policy and management and others uh, and this is where a lot of the supportive housing uh, is developed for the state of Connecticut or conceptualized. And we were very fortunate to be invited to join that group and then to be invited uh, to be um, invited to participate in the IDASH program. And the IDASH program was really the first time that DDS got to explore supportive housing de development which was new development and there was 20 million dollars in capital development uh, for development of new um, supportive units and affordable units and there were three developments awarded you're going to hear a little bit more about those later on in the presentation but that was a one-time thing that 20 million dollars and we wanted to find a way to leverage what we learned during that and continue to grow supportive housing and we were able to work with the committee, the interagency committee, and um, get a pathway to sustainability through accessing low income housing tax credit development. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the low income housing tax credit development and supportive housing. And there is an existing Department of Housing capital development process for new affordable housing. It's called low income housing tax credits. And we've been able to tap into that. And so far, there have been four developments awarded in which we've had supportive units. So the housing process uh, really starts when a provider identifies uh, a desire to develop this type of housing and talks to DDS about it. Often a lot has been going on at the, with the provider and, and perhaps uh, families they support and people they support who might be looking to move into something like this. And they find a developer to partner with. And often that developer seems to be in the same geographic vicinity as the provider. And they seek 
um, support, you know, from DDS and find out if DDS is interested. And then the provider submits a support service plan and a budget. And we write a letter of commitment to the developer. So what this is about is really, how does this housing get developed? Uh, we commit to the developer for the project-based rent, rental assistance subsidy for the agreed upon number of units should the award be awarded by Department of Housing and CHFA. And then the developer submits the tax credit development application. This might be a little bit technical, but like I said, we can share this information. And ultimately, Department of Housing and CHFA announce the awards. Some of the uh, housing that they award has supportive units in it. Some doesn't. What's, what's different is if a developer includes some supportive units in the development, then they get some extra points in the award process and may be more likely to get awarded. It's very competitive. We have goals and uh, the goals of our supportive housing projects are to expand access to integrated affordable supportive housing. We're strengthening linkages between housing and service providers, demonstrating the effectiveness of smart home and other types of assistive technologies, and supporting the move from more institutional care or congregate care models of living uh, to really living fully integrated into the community. And what do the people that are supported by us want and need? Generally, the feedback that we get is that they want the same things that we all want, which is to have a safe and affordable place to live, but they may also need some supports to do it, as some of us might. Um, they, they want the supports and the rental assistance to live independently. They, they want access to transportation, which equals access to community and work opportunity. If they don't want to work, uh, they may not be interested in work opportunities. However, having the availability and the ability to make the choice is essential to really living as full members of our communities. Having shared mixed use community space uh, really leads to more inclusion and participation in these developments. And we found that often if they're accessible or accessible ready, this is beneficial because it allows someone to stay where they are, even if their needs change a little bit, especially for temporary changes. A DDS provider who's interested in doing this type of development needs to be a qualified provider in good standing, uh, qualified to provide in-home supports, uh, qualified and enrolled as a Medicaid provider, um, active certification, and willing to take innovative approaches to community-based supports. Uh, you're gonna hear a little bit more from some of those providers uh, a little bit later on. And of course, a willingness to partner with a housing developer. Key elements of these successful developments include having uh, less than or equal to 25% of the total units in the larger development being supportive units. So the units, we wouldn't wanna see them all clustered together. Uh, if there's several buildings, ideally they're spread throughout the development. And if there's several floors, they're spread throughout the floors and the halls. However, um, it is always a person-centered living environment and there's an economy of scale in service delivery because the staff people who are on site can be available and can really assist several people in a shorter amount of time because of the proximal benefits, as well as the ability for people to reach out pretty quickly using often electronic means of communication to ask for some uh, time limited assistance. You can have a continuum of supports as needs change with with the on site staffing available and the ability to age in place, but maybe that term age in place might just mean change in place. We can go through changes. We can stay where we are. Maybe we'll regain some of the um, capacity that we had be before, but we wouldn't have to move. And, um, you know, the strong provider developer relationship can lead to better outcomes in the housing for the individuals who are living there. And um, their consideration, even at the uh, point of design sometimes with some of the developments that we've uh, heard of and that you're going to hear more about has been very consequential. So in terms of funding, uh, there's a few different ways that funding can work for this. 
we got some special funding to explore this and demonstrate that it could work for us. And that was IDASH. Beyond that, we haven't got special funding yet. Um, it doesn't mean in the future there might not be a time that that happens, but right now what we're using is this existing funding resource. There's low income housing tax credit development that the state is already doing, and we're getting some of those units without additional capital expenditure for DDS. In terms of how the rent gets paid, that's a very important thing. That's either paid through the state agency or through the housing agency. And that can be either project based or really resident based, meaning portable. And in this case, these rental subsidies come through the housing agency and they are managed the same way that say Section 8 or um, Section 811 uh, mainstream vouchers, vouchers are managed, but they're tied to the project. They're tied to the unit and we're committed to funding uh, those in those units for several years as part of our commitment to the development. In terms of service funding, there could be new service funding. We got some for IDASH, but uh, typically what you're going to see is existing recycled or portable funds, meaning uh, people who are moving into these new developments are either bringing some funding with them uh, or possibly getting some new recycled funding assigned to them through the PRAP process. And with that, I want to hand it off to others who have uh, really exciting things to share with you all. And uh, let me stop sharing my screen as quickly as possible. I think we're OK. Can you uh, did I uh, stop sharing my screen? You did Excellent. yes you did all uh, right thanks, very Josh. good and Thank now you. we're we're going to turn it over to steve morris who's going to talk a little bit about uh supported uh, supportive housing um and the favor experience great thanks lisa and good afternoon everybody i'm going to share my screen as well And can everybody see that? Not yet. No? OK, hold on. Try that again. Share. How about now? It's up. Thanks, Steve. All right. Great. Great. Technical difficulties. OK, so Josh, did a, thank you for doing that nice overview of supportive housing. I thought it would be helpful to just give a little bit of a history of Favar's experience with apartment supports to put some of this in context. Uh, so our first apartment supports happened in 1984. Um, back then, um, we placed people in different apartments in different parts of the community, all with the intention of integration. We figured if we didn't congregate people in the same apartment building, we're actually integrating them. Um, what took us 22 years to figure out is that in some cases, perhaps many cases, we were actually isolating people with that approach. So in 2006, uh, we had an existing complex in Avon where we had a few people. We started to move some more people in there and we developed our first cluster. Um, and what we quickly found out is that, you know, there's there's lots of efficiencies, of course, but the larger peer group really uh, benefited all of the residents. Um, and then in 2015, there's a, a complex in Simsbury called Ojeki and Commons. Uh, and that project was designed for people with MS. And the town of Simsbury told the developer, Reagan Associates, that they'd like to make some of the apartments available to people with different disabilities. So that's how Favar got connected with that particular project. And we now have eight single apartments in that complex. Because this, the apartment building was designed for people with MS, it was specially configured with extra accessibility features. And we learned a lot about extra accessibility or ADA plus features from that experience. And then of course, in 2016, just a year later, the IDASH um, notice of funding availability came out. We submitted two applications. And in March of 2021, we opened up Bear Woods Apartments in Canton. Uh, it's a 40, 
uh, unit apartment. We have 10 of the apartments. And as we speak, uh, we're opening up Lavender Fields apartments, same size, same similar configuration of Bloomfield. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about all of the components that made this work. Um, of course, there's the state financing from DDS, DOH, CHIFA. Other financing came through the federal low income housing tax credit investment process. Programmatic support, of course, is from DDS. The developer is Reagan Development, the developer that we met through that Ojakian Commons uh, apartment project. The Ark of the Farming Valley or Favar is the provider. And then we also had a lot of support from the town of Canton. I don't have it listed here, but also the town of Bloomfield and Voya was one of our sponsors. These are the two apartment projects. The one on the top is Canton. We call it Bear Woods. The one on the bottom is the Bloomfield apartment building. We call Lavender Fields. And here are the key features that they both share. So it's an inclusive setting. Um, no more than 25% of the units um, are set aside for people with IDD. We have the large peer group or the cluster with all of the associated benefits of that. It's affordable. Not only is the, the comp, each of the complexes affordable in itself, we also have the rental assistance packages that go with the IDD apartments. We have all of those accessibility features that we learned from the Ojakian Commons experience that was designed for people with MS. We also learned of a few that weren't uh, built into that complex um, through our exploratory uh, team meeting process through the design. Uh, and so, for example, we put in some non overflow toilets um because in a multi-floor apartment building that's one of the worst things that can happen a flooded apartment and all the bar apartments below it uh, we also built in reinforced ceilings so that somebody if they needed a hoyer type system in the future so that they could stay in their apartment the, the apartment would already have that capability versus very expensive retrofit as retrofit as an alternative of course we built in smart home tech we're still fine-tuning that uh, and we also created a healthy prepared meal program because we've learned that the less structured an environment, the sometimes worse um, someone's eating behavior can be. Uh, and that goes for all of us, right? Um, think about when you moved into your first apartment. Um, you ate all the stuff you loved, whether it was good for you or not. I think what really makes this process work is that it's a collaborative design process um, with the provider and the developer. Um, we met for months ahead of time. We held um, groups with parents and some of our staff and some of our potential residents. We talked about what they were looking for and we incorporated much of that into the design process. So being able to work with the developer to help design, particularly the specialty apartments uh, for folks with IDD was really beneficial. And of course, by doing this, um, we as soon as the apartment building's done, we create increased capacity. It's hard to create a cluster in existing apartment complexes because it's rare to find that many apartments in a single existing development that are available at any one time. So day one, you know, we've got nine or ten apartments available for new people. So the expansion of this model. In Connecticut, you can see through this chart, the first three were I dash. Uh, and then, as Josh mentioned, the uh, um, low income housing tax credit program is funding the other projects. Now, there's both a 4% project and a 9% project. The 9% is a higher reimbursement or um, benefit to the investors. Those are more competitive. The 4% is less competitive. They're all due in January. Uh, that's the one time a year that these applications are accepted. And then you can see that these eight projects are a bit scattered throughout the state. You can see the highlights. And all of this is increasing capacity for the apartment living uh, that supportive housing is all about. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Steve. That was great. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Marion Least, who's going to speak a little bit about the, the HARC supportive housing uh, initiative. Marion, are you there? You may be muted. I can see that you're here. You are muted, Marion. Marion, we can't hear you. Let me see if I can help with unmuting. No. I can't unmute, but what I could do is I could put the call in number in the chat. Marion, if if you're uh, able to hear us, you, per, you know, it's possible. I the, see Marion's name just lit up. Are you able to speak, Marion? Oh, yeah. Looks OK. OK. We can hear you, Marion. All right. Then I think we'll go out of order on the agenda and um, and we'll work through that technical issue. Um, Mark Kaczynski, are you are you ready? And I know Marion was going to introduce you, and so I will introduce you. Uh, Mark Kaczynski has joined us, and he's going to speak from a parent's perspective. Um, uh, supporting his daughter as uh, she made the transition into supportive housing. Welcome, Mark. Hi, everybody. I, is everybody able to see me? I uh, Yes, yes, yeah, we okay. can. Great. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I'm delighted to share our family's experiences. So uh, about six months ago, I think it's almost exactly six months ago, the end of January, our, our oldest daughter, Emma, um, became a, um, a resident at um, Clover Gardens in downtown Hartford, which is one of the new facilities um, under this initiative that you've been talking about. Um, Clover Gardens, um, I don't wanna speak on behalf of them, but um, it's really quite an extraordinary opportunity because the building itself is historic. It's on the historic preservation list, I believe. It's circa, you know, late 19th century. It looks a bit like the Mark Twain house in many ways. And it was completely restored thanks to the resources that this program was able to uh, um, was able to secure. So Emma is uh, 34 years old. She um, has been, um, she is an individual with intellectual disabilities, but she's been for a long time now really quite integrated in the community other than living on her own. So this has been the big transition for her is moving to her own apartment, which is really, really exciting. And the last six months have been all in all really very positive. So I just, I want to underscore that. I also want to thank all the groups that contributed to this and especially HARC, which is the organization that's supporting her in her apartment with staff support. I really wanna say on behalf of our family, how much we um, are grateful for that. So Emma during her uh, day is, is essentially, um, she's in her apartment, but she's working full-time. I, I call it full-time. She works every day of the week, Monday through Friday, at Real Art Ways, which has a, um, a group there called the Art Connection. The Art Connection is affiliated with VenFen, which is her agency for special needs individuals. I think it's located here in Connecticut in Windsor. 
Um, it's, it's a kind of interesting organization because it focuses on individuals who uh, enjoy performance and art. And um, as you can guess, working at the Real Art Ways, what this organization does is it allows individuals to work in, a, in an environment where they're producing artworks uh, and uh, working with others. So that's been terrific. She's been there since 2000, excuse me. Yeah, 2011. She's been there since the beginning. So uh, we're really excited that this year she's been able to move into this independent living and, uh, and now, you know, kind of make that transition part of her experience. So I just want to say on behalf of, you know, parents out there that are, that are listening to this or watching today, um, I mean, every individual I think is unique. But this is really a spectacular opportunity for our family members to move into another level of autonomy uh, and interdependence uh, and community living. All the things that you've been stressing in your opening remarks. Um, Clover Gardens is an integrated apartment building. There's only a couple units in her building for individuals with special needs. There's two other buildings nearby, but for the most part, they're living amongst community people, which is really what our family wanted. And I really, I believe is how Emma thrives because she does put herself in so many situations and has done that for so many years. She um, goes out to eat, she goes to community events, she's involved in the church. There's all kinds of things that Emma does very effectively and has really contributed to her development because she's been allowed to live in a totally inclusive environment, including her schooling here in West Hartford. So it's all of those factors that have really contributed to this, um, this moment. And so I just wanted to say to everyone, you know, this has um, really been very beneficial and it's been an exciting opportunity and we're really thrilled. Thanks, Mark. We really appreciate it. I'm going to check in. Marion, have you been able to join us? So I'm joining you, but it says that I'm Janice. <laughs> All right, Janice. <laughs> Welcome. You know what? Sometimes you just have to go with it, right? <laughs> We're nothing if we're not flexible. Welcome to Marion Least, who's going to talk a little bit about the Heart Clover Gardens uh, initiative. Well, unfortunately, I had a PowerPoint presentation, but um, I won't be able to show that because I can't. My computer's not functioning. But um, anyway, so so like Mark said, um, Clover Gardens is kind of a unique program. Um, so one of the things about Clover Gardens is that it's, it's a small complex. There's only 32 units in the entire complex. So it really is uh, a small little community. Um, and it's also located right in the, in the heart of, uh, Asylum Hill, the Asylum Hill neighborhood, right in, um, in Hartford. So that's something that, uh, I think was a drawback for some families when when we first uh, introduced the idea, but for other families, um, I think it's worked out very well. Um, one of the great parts about Clover Gardens is that uh, it is literally right on a bus line. Um, so transportation is is not an issue. We have many people who are living in the complex who are you know, going to work, taking the bus to work or taking paratransit to work, um, you know, right from right from their doorstep practically. Um, and it has really made for a nice uh, transition over there. Um, I think one of the things that we are most impressed with is the amount of growth that we've seen in the individuals that we support in 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 this program. Um, you know, some of the individuals like like Mark's daughter um, came from home. It's their first experience living on their own. So this is this is a new a new thing for them. Um, others have, you know, lived out of the home, but lived, you know, only in a group home. And for each and every one of them to watch them have blossomed, um, how much they've blossomed and how much they've learned. Um, to live more independently, um, 
and to really um, take pride in their self-assurance and their um, and their their independence. It's amazing to me how far people have come in, in such a short period of time. Um, our program's only been open really since January. Our last person actually moved in, in uh, I think it was actually May. Um, so that's how new we are. Um, but to have seen growth just um, in just a short period of time um, is, is pretty astonishing. Um, you know, we, we have one one person who moved into the complex who was living in his own apartment. I mean, I'm sorry, he was living in a group home. So he had 24 hour supports and we had a, um, you know, there there were a lot of doubts on the team as to whether or not he could he could do this. And um, he was actually very determined and he really wanted to live on his own. Um, so it has proved to be such an amazing experience for him to, and and to watch him grow from um you know when we when we first came in i mean he wasn't even he wasn't even cooking a meal on his own he wasn't he wasn't doing any of that um he was a hundred percent all of his medications were being administered by staff he is now a hundred percent self-administering he is um, he cooks his own breakfast by himself without staff um, and just to see the pride that he takes in that is absolutely amazing and he's only been living in in that apartment since March so four months is all it has taken to see that kind of growth so I just I think that it's a message to to all of us that um, you know, as much as we want to um, protect the people that we support, um, you know, to to provide them with opportunities for growth and independence, as as much as they are possibly capable, and integrate the the um, the supports where we need to, the technology where we need to, it's. It's just absolutely amazing and, and people can accomplish way more than we ever can imagine. So, you know, for me, that's my personal takeaway from this program, because I did dare to imagine. I did imagine that, you know, a lot of these guys could could be more independent, but they're even surprising me. So I think that's that's the message is that sometimes we don't give people opportunities. Um, and we hold people back and we need to, to to learn to help people to be as independent as safely as possible and and just integrate the right support so that they can do it. Thank you, Marion. And I see that we're getting a number of questions and we are gonna hold questions until the end, but if you have a question and you wanna um, put it in the chat, that's fine. Uh, now, I could not be more excited to welcome our next presenters. Uh, Scott and Lauren, are you with us? I'm going to ask Penny to share okay. her screen and she's helping film this. All right. So Scott and Hi. Lauren are good. OK, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon. This is Penny Phillips and I'm going to be filming Scott and Lauren at Bear Woods. Uh, they are not back from work yet, so we might need another 10, 15 minutes before we can present them. Penny, would you prefer that we can um, we can go to the next presenter and and we can wait until uh, Scott and Lauren arrive home? That would be perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, um, then. Mike Maynard, are you available? I'm here. I'm here, awesome. Eliza. We're going to turn it over to you then. Thank God. I don't want to follow Scott and Lauren. I mean, they're a tough act. To that would be a really <laughs> tough act. <laughs> so thank you very much. I just want to say Steve and Marion are my heroes on this call because we're about three weeks from moving in 12 individuals uh, down at Riverfront. So my team's wondering why I'm not out there helping them right now and why I'm on a call. But uh, 
hearing the, the extraordinary things and Steve's been, I mean, we've been talking for a year about the extraordinary things that happen in these developments. We're really excited and hearing Mark earlier talk about from a parent's perspective. Uh, this has been an extraordinary amount of work for us. I'm struck by how complicated it's all been, but it's been such a labor of love that my team has just invested in a way I've never seen before. So a lot of moving parts, a lot of really robust partnerships. From, from the outset, Josh was working with the central office to get, help the, the uh, Penrose folks get uh, financing in place. Um, and the commissioner has been very supportive of us as well. DDS West region, the entire team there, Fritz and Shannon and John and Sarah um, and Lorraine and everybody just supporting us every step of the way. And then families in the community supporting us as well. We've actually even done some fundraising around this. There's real active interest in the community about helping supplement the startup funds that we get from DDS for individuals because seven of the 12 individuals coming into the riverfront complex, this will be their first time out on their own. So you can imagine it's life changing for families. It really is. I mean, and they're just, you know, they're anxious, they're apprehensive, but they're also really excited because this is a new chapter for all of them, particularly for parents who've worried about what the next chapter would look like. Um, We've been busy as all heck for the past. I, I, I would say to folks who are planning to do this, it starts slow and then it gets quiet and then it gets faster. And then by the end, it's like a punch list mentality. It's very fast. And so we've been counting on our colleagues throughout the state for support. Favar has been wonderful supporters of ours and, and let us impose on them multiple times over and over again. Uh, Pam at Midstate Arc, her team was out here a few times in the past week helping us with assistive technology. Uh, assessments uh, and helping us with installs and the like. So uh, there are a lot of moving parts, like I said, but it does seem to be just a, an extraordinary opportunity. Like Steve, we've supported folks in IHS settings as one-offs in, in, in apartments throughout the community here in Northwestern Connecticut, but this is the first time we're going to be doing this. And we're 12 of 60 units in a brand new build by a developer who has their eyes set on Connecticut market. Clearly, they're looking to do more of this type of work. They've been a joy to work with. They've been very accommodating. And while we got to the process after the real design was in place, they've been accommodating throughout and handed over units for us and retrofitted units, gave us all of the uh, fully accessible units for our use for the 12 uh, of, of our set-aside cluster. So we're grateful to them as well. We're grateful to the city of Torrington and, and the mayor's office who wanted this to work um, and wanted LARC to be uh, the agency that they partnered with. So uh, one thing that it strikes me, as I say to my team these days, is right on the other side of this, we've learned a lot in this process. I joke that we don't want to make Favar's mistakes. There's no reason to. We can learn from them. We're going to make our own shiny new mistakes. <laughs> but. There are so many complexities with these projects that it seems to me that the way that they're going to get easier and easier to deploy in the future, and I think they're really a great model to keep expanding upon, and I was excited to hear Josh say there was plans to do that, uh, is for all of us who've been through this journey to serve as a, a support group for folks who are coming after us. So, you know, we've made it clear that anything we can do to help folks who might be thinking about doing this we're an open book. We're willing to share documents and, and, and support service plans and, and budgets and everything we can. But I'd also like for the department to think about ways to use us and maybe have some sort of ad hoc committee that could get together and, and, and troubleshoot uh, and also serve as in an advisory capacity to folks who want to do this. We're certainly willing here at LARC to, to pay it forward in that way. We've gotten a lot of great support from our colleagues. Um, and we want to be willing to extend that support to, to the community as well moving forward. So we're very excited. Uh, I think August is going to be a very complicated month for us. <laughs> move in date, I think, is the 15th. It hasn't budged. They could move a week, uh, but uh, there are a lot, a lot of moving parts um, and uh, we're ready. I think we're ready to have a busy summer and, and I'm excited to join Steve and, and Marion on the other side of this journey when we have folks, you know, in these units and, and living together and enjoying their new lives. So we're grateful to be part of this and really honored to be at the table. Thanks, Mike, and consider yourself invited to the ad hoc committee. We've certainly <laughs> been picking Steve's brain 
and yep. we do have a supportive housing uh, uh, work group that's already in place. So uh, we will definitely be taking you up on that. Excellent. So Penny, um, has Scott and Lauren arrived home, or we can we can continue on the agenda, and and you can just let us know when they're ready. Okay. Well, they are here. So um, I'm going to turn my camera on. Just stand out there, guys. Um, here's my camera. We can see you. Now I'm going to turn it around. Yeah, and I'm going to load up for you so you can you could see it how's that looking we can see it okay well welcome to bear woods everyone and uh this is our front doors and look who's waiting for us at the at the front door It's Scott Warren. Hi, yep. Scott Hi. Warren. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Welcome, welcome to Bear Woods. <laughs> you want to take us inside? Yeah. Sure. What you what you doing there, Scott? Uh, I'm doing. I'm using this fob to enter our apartment Great. building. That's the only way you could get in because it's very secure. Fantastic. What's this room? Uh, which one? We're, the one we're in right now. Uh, it's, this is the lobby where we meet with family or whoever and our staff. Uh, and when we um, leave to go from here to our program in the mornings, we gather around and meet all our friends. Great. And we walk to our program. And um, what's over here? The mail room. Okay, so this is how we check our mail when we come home from work. So I, what I'm about to do is use my mail key and go like this. And there's no mail. So usually, We'll get mail usually. It's nothing at all. Or sometimes it's a lot of things. Sometimes it's a lot of things. Excellent. What's over here? This is our staff office where if we need anything, we can go to our staff members from Favor. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's next? Um, what? the laundry. That's a good idea. Right. So, all right. Here. This is where we do our laundry. This is our laundry room. And we have two laundry rooms in this apartment building. This is one of them, and there's another one upstairs. This and these the guys city. have um parts. Money. All oh, right. It's okay, you don't need them. Okay. All right. All right. So um so this is a dollar ninety-five for these two and for these two. So, and what that is is the washing machine. The others are the dryers. Mm -hmm. Great. And you have a card that we have lets a card. you. We have a, so, this, this guy, what we use this for is to load up money on the card. So, like, pay, oh, you're down a dollar or something. You just go here. And you just put your card right here, put your debit card in here, and say how much you want. And that's how much you might want. And it goes on the card. Yep. Yeah, it does. Awesome. It transfers from one card to the other. Excellent. Yeah. Where's next? Where are we going next? So, uh, how about your apartment? Yeah, well, I would say our elevator's right there. So and the elevator's there. right here. How many floors? Uh, There's three floors in here. So but the upstairs is 
all my community down here. There's mostly Favar, but there's some um, mid community. And technically, we're on the second floor. floor. Okay. And yeah. then the bottom floor is the ground floor. So that's like where the community rooms are and whatnot. All right. There's a conference room right across from. And this is the conference room. Okay. Is this this is Favar's conference yeah, room? Favar's yep. conference kind of an extra room that you can yep. use so with like staff if you need it. Managers use that. Oh. Other staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. They kind of sort things in here. All right. I just used our key to open our apartment. Great. And this apartment's handicap accessible. It is. That's why the big doors and everything. So this guy, if you push this, this guy automatically opens. Automatically just opens automatically. Super. Let's let's look at the kitchen together. Why don't you describe where we are, please? Okay. So here's our kitchen. So Every night I cook. I might cook on this. So, and this is an induction. So, where um, where it is sensitive. Let me tell you, I'm not a big fan of the sensitive stove, but I um, so like this is our oven right here, and um, down here is where we store pans and whatnot, and then. Um, and this guy turns off. Did you say on that? I think. Yeah, like, and it turns off faster than. The yeah, it turns off faster. And this little guy is the gadget. So, say like you have water boiling or pasta or cooking something. This guy has five minutes. This guy has five minutes. I don't know why ours is five minutes. Well, you don't have to go right here. No, but but this is five minutes, and then it counts back. So it counts back. If someone steps away. If you step away, like far far away, it'll count start counting backwards. And um. And if it goes off, the alarm goes off. What happens? Then the whole stove goes off. And this guy, this guy, all this goes off. Oh, shuts off. It's a safety. Yeah. Yep. It's a safety awesome. feature. Awesome. Just like how wide where the sink is, uh, like the bottom there is for wheelchairs. Nice. Yeah. So. Nice. It's a it's a beautiful kitchen. Yep. Can you yeah. show me um the I'll, living room? Yeah, I'll show you the living room. But first, before we get in the living room, here's where we eat our dinners and our breakfast and lunch. Table for two. Table for two. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, actually. It's not just a table for two. Okay. Company. Yeah, company. It, yeah. So, like, if one of our parents is over, we um can open the we can open the guys up. Excellent. Add a couple not of chairs. Parents, but friends. Nice. Yeah, we've had friends come here and. So this is the living room. Nice living room. Our couch. This is the couch. Coffee table. This is. The coffee table and the chair came from my dad's house and that chair came from his uh bedroom and here's mm -hmm. our tv big old tv nice our desk yeah mm -hmm. great what, yeah. what's next um, um should we should i show the blind like the uh, oh, yeah go ahead yeah so what i'm about whoops did i hit the wrong don't I know, I'm trying. Don't do the living room one, just do the... Okay, so just do... I guess we'll do the, so the bedroom blind. Yeah, that blind, no. No, okay. Mm -hmm. But this is our, our bedroom blind. And as you can see, it's going down. So you can put it on a timer? Yep, or? there's a controller this, that we use. So this guy is the controller. Hold on, they put it, hold it up again. So that's our controller. Yep, so that's our controller. Nice. That's pretty fancy. Yeah. It is fancy. <laughs> okay. 
and a really nice bedroom here. Bedroom. Yeah, this is our bedroom. My this is our bedroom. For like a one person bedroom. And a, and a very nice orderly, spaces. orderly closet. Nice this job. This is organized, I love it. It is organized. <laughs> And whose dad built this? My dad. Nice. He did so a great job. my father-in-law built it. He's, he said if, if we ever move out, that's staying right there like that. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else will <laughs> ever move out. And this is our bed right here. It's this nice is bed. our bed. Our big comfy bed. How about your, is there a bathroom here? Uh, yes, no, there sure. is. So... So this is our bathroom. Nice roll-in shower. Yeah. And Walk so this shower. is the best shower ever because <laughs> um so like say the water comes out, yeah, it can go right into the drain. Nice. You don't have to worry about sweating. No. Awesome. That's the best. That's like the best thing. Awesome. Good amount of space for a person or two people, yeah, whichever. Yeah, we got cabinets there. Yeah. Um, so the cabinets are right here. And um, so this is where we do our daily routine stuff. To get ready for work. Um, to get ready for work. Or at night to shower. Well, it's a beautiful place, And guys. there's a utility closet right here, which we don't really open. And all of your... Wedding cards. So, cards. yeah, so all of our wedding cards are slowly coming off the door. <laughs> but <laughs> that's so special. And, you guys uh, when, when when was the wedding again? May twenty first. Well, congratulations. And we got a closet over there for storage. Yeah, well let's not forget about the closet for storage. Yeah, because we got so you need you need that for yeah. all your stuff, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. I think that's everything, right? And our bed also has storage too like it has drawers. Oh underneath? Yeah, it has yeah, storage underneath. So like, for example, like, like that. Perfect. Yeah. Because you, you can't have enough storage. No. no. Okay. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, I think mm -hmm. we're done. You want to say goodbye to everyone? Bye everyone. Bye everybody. Thank you for hey Scott and Lauren, thank you so much. I came oh. out to visit before. <laughs> People moved in, but um, now that you're in, it certainly is a home, and what a beautiful home you have. Thank you for sharing it with us. It definitely feels like home now since we moved in. Yeah, it really does. At first, it took a while to get used to, but now it's hard to leave this place. I can understand. It's a beautiful home. Thank you so much. Welcome. You're welcome. Okay, now. All right. Stop sharing here. This should be interesting. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you were a smart man. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> All right. We're going to continue on with our agenda. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Pam and Aaron from CRI. And I do have your presentation. Um, so I am gonna share my screen. Let me Thank you. And yes, that, that is a that is a very tough Sorry act guys. To <laughs> <laughs> um we I'm are gonna, actually I'm gonna share the yep. presentation. I won't be able to see the screen, so just let me know when you want me to advance. Okay. We um, have partnered with the uh, West Haven Housing Authority and uh, Troutbrook Realty Development to um, open a property in West Hartford on um, New Park Avenue. It's still in construction. This is what it will look like when it's finished. We don't have any stories to tell of um, people's successes because we don't we haven't actually moved anybody in yet. Um, but uh, could you advance the slide, please, Elisa? It's uh, it's designed for 17 individuals. Uh, there are five one bedroom apartments and six uh, two bedroom apartments that will be developed. It is right on the fast track bus lane. So you can enter the fast track bus line at either end of the street on New Park Avenue. Um, the original opening date, which you know we 
these are the things that 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 you'll have problems with. The original opening date was June due to all of the supply chain issues we've had. And they have actually a lot of staffing issues also trying to hire people and get um, contractors in. Uh, we are now looking at probably mid to end of September. Um, the plan is for our guys to move in first. Um, and the first floor should be open. They're going to open one floor at a time um, over a month period. And the first floor should be open by the end of September. So we're hoping to have full occupancy by the end of October. Um, could you advance the slide? What we're in the middle of right now is um, is the referral process and application process, which is we are finding out quite cumbersome and involved. And I'll let Erin speak about that because she's uh, knee deep in it right now um, and getting everybody qualified for the low income housing. Thank you, Pam. So, you know, locating 17 appropriate applicants um, who potentially can live together. Um, obviously, we have, you know, five one bed units and, and six two bed units. Um, one bed units are, are often a preference for people. Um, we did have access to um, a number of ADA units, which we have taken advantage of. Um, you know, a, a number of people have said this, but I think getting in as soon as you can with your, you know, development company, um, with the leasing company, really working hand in hand with them. There were some things that were actually recommended um, by Steve and, and Favar, which we were looking to get implemented. However, where we sort of came in in the process, there were some things that we weren't able to do um, that we would have liked to be able to do. Um, but some of the things that you know we sort of did do was stack apartments so that all of our individuals, because they have to be throughout the building, are at least in one section. Um, you know, if someone walks really heavy or is dropping things on the floor on a regular basis, it's a simple, hey, you know, can you just keep in mind your neighbors downstairs, um, you know, maybe having some issues with with how heavy you're walking and we have a little bit more control over that. Um, the 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 thing we're in now sort of knee deep is the actual application process because most of our individuals have been identified um, and it, it's pretty cumbersome, it, as Pam said. Um, you know, there's an application for the rental, um, which is through the actual um, you know, leasing department. Um, so paperwork, um, copy of a current identification, state, you know, ID or a passport, um, social security card, birth certificate. I think some of those things that we sort of think, um, don't think twice about are things that we need to have access to when we realized that over COVID, a lot of people didn't get to the DMV to get their ID renewed, or somebody doesn't know where a birth certificate or social security card is. Um, you know, pay stubs if a person works, current letter from Social Security with entitlements, um, bank statements, a number of bank statements. We need to have, um, you know, probate documentation if someone is um, has has guardianship. You know, some of these things have been challenging because a lot of people didn't get updated paperwork throughout COVID. So now we have people who have to reach out to the probate court to get updated documentation. So all of these things, you know, sort of can impede the pro, you know, the process. Um, there's also the RAP um, application, which is for the rental assistance program, which in and of itself is a whole bunch of other paperwork um, that's done annually, as is the lease. Um, you know, it's also done if there are significant changes to income, if someone starts working, if someone stops working, or if um, there's a change to, you know, entitlements in, in any significant way, um, that has to be taken care of, you know, relatively soon. Um, so that's sort of where we are, you know, um, I think it was Michael that said, things start out slow, and then they speed up and that's, you know, that's sort of very true. Um, 
you know, it, it seems like you're not getting anywhere, you're not getting anywhere. And then suddenly it's like, oh, we need 10 more people. And maybe it's opening next month or maybe it's not opening next month. So I think managing expectations for people, trying to communicate with your individuals who are already selected and who, you know, have been waiting and continue to wait and the level of anxiety that they have is sort of increasing and, and sort of trying to manage some of that. So it's not necessarily just, you know, the paperwork or identifying people. It's also kind of working with those people to make sure that, you know, the whole process goes as smoothly as possible and that they're set up for success. Um, you know, we we are part of um, Mid-State state Arts um, ATEC um you know services so that's been critical um they just had a conference last week which was very very helpful for us to see some of the things that are available um you know for for the use of technology so those are sort of the things that we're looking at and we're you know really anticipating that things will uh, move very quickly over the next couple of months and come september i will be michael worrying about <laughs> getting 17 people in um you know to a building so that is where we are at alisa could you reshare your screen uh someone else is sharing screen and it's not the presentation anymore i think i pretty much covered it josh it was Okay. So some Thanks, of that. So don't Aaron. no worry about that. No worries. I okay. Not, Thank I, you. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't know that happened. I was <laughs> I was following along on the presentation. I can I have the the slides. If I think no, you did touch okay. on most I, of the things. Yeah, I, I think I covered it all. It, it was only five slides. It wasn't complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. All right. Um, so those um, are the uh, presentations as far as um, providers. And then um, has Steve joined us? So Josh, I know Steve was going to come from a different meeting and he may not have, um, he was tentative in terms of whether he well, I'm here. To join. Oh, you are here. Great. I am here. I sneaked in. I sneaked awesome. in about a half hour ago. All right, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you from the Department right. of Housing. Thanks. This is great, everybody. Happy to be here. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. I am not a PowerPoint kind of a guy. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what DOH does and, and how we're so super excited to be working with our partner and our sister agency, the Department of Developmental Services, to really provide a level of supportive housing that has not existed in the state until a, a couple or maybe even just this past year. So uh, we at DOH believe that uh, housing is the foundation for most of the work that we do, and we really want to partner with a many, as many of our sister state agencies as possible to ensure that the folks that they serve have access for permanent housing. We know that when folks have permanent housing access, their quality of life improves, and we think that that is just something that we all strive for. Uh, we really want to work with uh, different partners within our state agencies to really accomplish a couple of different goals. One, as we're doing here with the Department of Developmental Services, is really to increase permanent housing and independent living options, because we at DOH do believe that the vast majority of people in our state, even with assistance, can live independently on their own. So we really do want to provide that opportunity. Um, the other, uh, and, and, and we have programs like this with the Department of Mental Health and Education Services for our homeless population. We work with the Department of Corrections for folks reentering, uh, and we work with the Department of Children and Families to reunite families so that they are not separated due to a wide variety of circumstances. We also provide uh, regular affordable housing for folks that may not have any disabilities, but just uh, are living um, in a poverty situation because we also believe that the ability to provide that level of permanent housing will uh, increase and improve outcomes on a wide variety of spectrums. Like I said, all the way from mental health to reducing recidivism, the job uh, attainment, and we we just know that uh, the the housing end of this is is so important, so that people can live independently in the community. 
working with DDS has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we they sat with us for a number of years just trying to learn how we at DOH do affordable housing. And yes, I've heard from a couple of the providers that it is difficult. Housing can be complicated, even for somebody like me who works in it. I know the other side of the shop where they actually do the development is even more complicated than my side of the shop, which is more on the services side. So I certainly appreciate everybody's patience and trying to deal with environmental reviews and architectural problems and cost spikes and all the things that go along with it. But I think in the end, you see the, the product that is delivered here is something that is just amazing. And it really gives folks the opportunity to, to live in an unrestricted environment and folks can really thrive um, in, in that living situation. So our intent is to continue to partner with DDS. We would love to see more opportunities become available. When we put out our first uh, joint RFP, you know, we went through the capital dollar so quickly, it was just unbelievable. And DDS has been really nimble and innovative and, and using the funds that the legislature has given them to be able to provide some rent assistance and supportive services to some of the tax credit properties. Now, I think they're probably coming close to the end of that. Um, and what we really need to do is is work uh, together. And, I, and I'm pretty sure by judging by the number of people on this call that there is really a great advocacy community that really can advocate for continued support for these type of programs. Because we know that the more housing we provide, the better the outcomes are going to be and the more people that will be able to live independently in the community. So as we get to that point, I'm certainly uh, uh, sure that our partners will be looking to you to help us, you know, advocate for additional funds so we can continue these programs going. Um, so I, I think that's just the basis of what I would like to say. I do see the comment there from Charlene. Um, totally agree that we we would love to provide as many different types of housing as possible. And I've been working with a wide variety of, of different state agencies. So the more that we can get to, the more that we can have less people falling through the cracks um, so that we can really provide that level of assistance to those who need it. So we are working on it and hopefully we'll be able to get to you soon. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them because I think questions are after me, but there might be another presenter. Questions are after you and right. I'll, um, thank you so much. So those are our presentations for today and I've been keeping my eye on the chat and I'm going to go um, back to the beginning as far as questions go. And uh, Mark, if you're on, there was a question for you as far as how you um, initiated the process of um, having the dis discussion about supportive housing for Emma and who did you talk to? Okay, yes. Uh, well, we were on a waiting list um, for a while. Um, I think quite a while and um, I think at least 10 years. So we've been, you know, kind of just monitoring this situation since Emma left, um, you know, since she got out of high school and her extended, um, you know, her extended program up through 21. So as I said during my opening remarks, she's been involved with VenFen, her agency, out of, um, it's up in the uh, Windsor area, and she works over at Real Artways. She's been doing that since 2011, so since she left um, her coverage here in, this, in town through the school system. So we've really been waiting and, um, you know, we've we had frequent conversations with DDS, our, you know, our agency spokespeople kept us informed. And when the opportunity came up, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a slam dunk at first because um, like you've pointed out, a couple of the presenters pointed out, there have been some hiccups in getting things done on time because of COVID. We, um, I think we had a move-in date that was a little earlier than January, but, um, you know, because of COVID, we had to wait a little further, but all in all, it was, um, it was well worth the wait, obviously. Thank you very much. All right, the next, and uh, let me tell you, you got lots of great feedback in the chat, so um, just a, a lot of appreciation of, of your presentation. Uh, the next question, will there be any opportunities developed east of the river? Um, and I can feel that at this point, I know that there's been a lot of interest in opportunities east of the river. I know that there's um, a, a core group of people that have been advocating for that. This point in time, I'm not aware of any east of the river developments that are in process. Uh, 
Um, let's see. Other questions about um, initiating um, how to how to initiate the process and. I would say that if you're interested in supportive housing in the future, make sure your case manager is aware. And so uh, when there is an opportunity that becomes available, um, we will uh, make uh, case managers aware. And if they're aware that you're interested in supportive housing, um, they would reach out when there's a, a development that um, is scheduled to open in your general area and remember the lead time is quite significant so um, from concept to actual opening um, it's not uncommon to look at maybe a two-year period uh, more or less um, what is the typical level of staff support for someone in um, supportive housing or i dash one of the providers want to um, I can take that. So, I mean, I think it really depends on the individual. So, you know, for us, um, uh, most of the individuals we support are funded um, uh, through IHS hours, um, and they range from, you know, I think the person with the highest number of hours has like 36 hours a week. Um, not, you know, not, of course, counting day support. Um, and then, of course, there's the option too for cluster supports, which our program uh, is not funded as cluster supports, which would have overnight staffing. Um, we do not have overnight staffing in our in our program because we found that that actually wasn't necessary for the the people that that ended up moving into the complex. But I'm sure other providers have different experiences. Does anyone else want to add to that? You know, Eliza, here at LARC, we are planning for overnight staffing, although the hours I think for most of the individuals supported in this program are smaller. They're not they're not 30 plus hours. I think most of the individuals are either working or in day programs and um, maybe 12 to 15 hours a week. It sounds like the number that I'm, I'm thinking. And, and then the overnight those, supports would be available as needed as needed, right? And those are those are built into the budget from the outset, and some of those account for some of those individual hours. So there's a little bit of a calculus going on there to all make right. that all work, as, as I recall. The budget, it's been a while. <laughs> that document's a bit old. You're right, it's two, two and a half, three year project. So some of these things are. And I, I want to um just want to reiterate that the forum next month is going to uh, focus on IHS, individualized housing supports and assistive technology. And so I think we're going to be talking and there will be uh, a little bit more information and a little bit uh, more in terms of um, um, personal presentations. And so um, uh, there will be consistency within the theme. We'll also talk about clustered IHS, which has that uh, overnight support um, available. Um, let, me just, let me just add oh, a couple more, a couple more details from my daughter's uh, experience. She receives 14 hours of support, staff support, and um, she's she's doing very well with that. So the staff support focuses particularly on her dinner preparation. Uh, my daughter is able to manage everything else. She makes her own lunches, takes them to work. She gets her own bus. She makes her own breakfast, uh, but she does need that that support for dinners and dinner preparation and grocery shopping, and that's been working out very well. You know, it's really a skill building um, process as well. Nothing's nothing's really set in stone here, and we've learned probably more more than anything else about human nature. I'm raising my daughter. Uh, we're all, I think basically the same way in this sense. We're all differently abled, uh, I believe. Um, I don't think all of us are <laughs> very good at everything. I mean, even using technology here today shows some of us struggle more with it than others. Uh, in fact, uh, my daughter can quickly get me uh, situated online much faster than I can sometimes do that. So um, I would just say that, you know, the staffing support has been very 
precisely uh, driven by, you know, um, evaluation of her skills and her background. Uh, the, uh, you know, our caseworker has been extremely helpful in doing that. And we're very grateful to that and, and to Hart because without these professionals, this would not really be successful. It isn't that every possibility is being covered. I mean, life is not something you can absolutely predict. And we don't want that. We want, um, we really want our daughter to be able to stretch, to, uh, to go through some frustration during the day so that she can learn to overcome that, just so it isn't so much that, she, you know, it, it, it gets to the point where she becomes dysfunctional. But that hasn't been the case at all. It's been really a great fit and um, I would just, you know, say to those members that are joining us, the family members today that are joining us, you know, be sure you have a, a lot of conversation with your, um, with your staff, excuse me, with your caseworker. Caseworkers were the most important people for us to get the first step started. Thank you. The next question, uh, Steve, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, focus for you. It's a, somebody who has um, a daughter who has housing support needs, but doesn't qualify for DDS services and is on um, the brain injury waiver. And they're asking, the housing opportunities discussed today are exactly what she needs. Are, are there any resources that might be available? So we do support one one person uh, with a traumatic brain injury at uh, the complex that I refer to, OJK and Commons in Simsbury. So we certainly have that capability. Um, you know, we we try to keep mindful of not exceeding that 25% of the units um, standard, um, but we we certainly have some openings for people who are are interested in applying and either privately paying or who have alternate sources of funding for staff resources. Thank you. Um, there is a question about um, how might this work for a person that has one-to-one -one support needs? Um, and I think at this point, we don't have an, anyone with one-to-one -one support needs. I think that would be an individual planning process in terms of, of those supports. All right. Um, the names of the assistive housing are and where they are listed. Um, and I can bring up a slide up as far as um, anticipated developments. So let me do that. It's nowhere near as pretty as some of the other slides, but hopefully it does the trick. And there are, can you see that? Are people able to see that? We can see it. Okay, thank you. So these are some developments. It, it includes the developments that we've talked about here today and some that are on the horizon. There are others that are in initial stages of discussion, but this gives you an idea of um, uh, some of the projected developments that, um, that are in process. And as far as the names of the developments that we talked about today, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I guess each, each of you can go through and, and just share the names of the developments. Steve, we'll start with you. You're looking for the names of our developments? Yes, the names and where they are. So our, our Canton project is called Bear Woods. It's on Commerce Drive in Canton. And our Bloomfield complex is called Lavender Fields. And it's on Cottage Grove Road in Bloomfield. And Marion? Our program is called Clover Gardens. It's located on Asylum Avenue and Huntington Street in Hartford. Um, and uh, it's about a actually a block away from our Hart building. 
Thank you. And Mike? Yeah, our development is Riverfront. It's on Franklin Street uh, in Torrington, and it's about a probably 15 or 20 minute walk from our main office here on Main Street in Torrington. Great. And Pam? Um, we are calling ours New Park Avenue because we're not terribly original. Uh, it's on New Park Avenue in West Hartford. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any projects in Lower Fairfield County, uh, Stamford, Norwalk? Um, Josh, any any discussion of projects in that general area? None, none have been proposed that I'm aware of, Elisa, um, during the time I've been involved, which is the whole time <laughs> so far. Um, I'm not aware of any. Um, and that requires the partnership of the the developer with the DDS provider, which uh, every year there's a bidders or a developers conference for developers where they learn about these programs. And there's other ways that uh, people match make as well in terms of meeting developers. And uh, a lot of that can be community based or other contacts, uh, business development. So there's many different ways that that happens, I would say. But in terms of um, <clears throat> what DDS isn't able to do is that type of targeted development because the competitive nature of the um, low income housing tax credits, which we're relying upon for the developments um, are in in different areas. If Steve Delella is still on from housing, I'm not sure if that's something that housing looks at, Steve, in terms of just broad based uh, geographic diversity. But I think there's so many things that they're looking at in terms of the need. I saw another one of these questions, Elisa, about is there a waiting list in a certain area and a certain count? Fairfield County, and I would say that um, in terms of what we know about for our, our planning list and our waiting list, that certainly there's, uh, we I ask what service people are looking to, to get. So we're asking if people want in-home supports. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, that, I don't believe that there's, you know, that that exists necessarily at that level. So it's something that both Department of Housing and CHFA look at in terms of their priorities of where they support housing. And also it's something DDS has to consider when a provider comes to DDS to look for engagement is, are there, is there a need in that area? Thanks. So yeah, so from the DOH perspective, certainly we are looking to provide housing options throughout the state. Um, in every community um, that we can. Uh, so clearly we do have uh, just regular straight affordable housing as well as some other supportive housing for our homeless uh, in Lower Fairfield County. So it can be done, uh, but we do need to have that developer uh, and service provider combination that is willing to put forth an application and do the work to get it done. Um, otherwise, we obviously can't do it. Um, in fact, we even try to um, uh, incentivize uh, affordable housing developments in high opportunity areas. So some of those um, richer suburban towns that you may think of. Uh, so I know CHFA does give some bonus points on some of their applications if they're located in some of those higher opportunity areas. So I think that just shows that we are willing and able to provide affordable housing wherever we get a quality application. So if anybody wants to work with a developer and a service provider down in Fairfield County, uh, I think DOH certainly would be happy to, to fund a project like that or like these down there. Thanks, Steve. Uh, there's a question, if a person needs 24-7 supervision, would uh, this type of housing work if they had a roommate and a live-in uh, support person? And I think um, we did do some exploration about um, when we had some two-bedroom apartments. Uh, uh, I think uh, the... Um, the clarification was that it doesn't need to be two people supported by DDS. It could be a person and um, a, a, a live-in person. 
Um, but I think that would depend on um, the individual circumstances and that would be a, a team planning process. Yeah, on the I rental assistance side, we certainly do allow for live-ins uh, to be able to assist folks with disabilities live out in the community. So from our end at DOH, that's, that's okay. But clearly, I think I do uh, agree with Elisa. It should be um, looked at each individual case to determine if, if that is the best the best setting for for that individual to live. We also explored um, people who have um, a, um, a dependent, like a dependent child or a, a family member they're caring for or something like that. So those were things that that we were exploring and open to as well. So sometimes um, for the individuals that we support that have um, that have a child, housing, finding housing is is even harder. So this is definitely a good option for for people like that as well. Absolutely. Um, there are a number of people that have expressed interest in future forums and uh, there will be a schedule that will be distributed. If you put your name and your uh, email in the in the chat, we'll be sure to send you information on future forums. Uh, it's the same login information. So if you remember the fourth Tuesday of every month at three o'clock, um, if you use this link, uh, it's, it, uh, you will be able to log in. Um, but we will be distributing the schedule and, and we'll use the same distribution um, lists. And if you uh, do put your contact information in the chat, we certainly will, um, we will add you to the distribution list. Um, uh, for Pam and Aaron, are there already recipients selected for the West Hartford New Park Ave development, or are you still considering applications for referrals? We're still taking, uh, we have a couple of openings um, that we are, I'm, I'm still in the process of meeting with people. Um, we're hoping to have it nailed down within the next couple of weeks, um, but, but we are still looking. And we'll need a waiting list as well, too, so. And then there is a question about the Bloomfield Canton and Hartford com complexes. Is there availability? Um, and um, I think it, it's the, the um, I think all of those uh, developments are fully occupied at this point. Is that correct? Um, but uh, the yeah. idea of a waiting list is, is a good one. So yeah, Canton, also, Canton is full. Um, we, we ran into a, a problem that some of you who do this in the future may also run into with Bloomfield. Because the project was delayed uh, almost a year during during COVID and is just opening this month, um, one or two of the individuals who, who had been pre-approved um, had, had started working too many hours and, and they may have just missed the qualify, qual, being qualified at this point. Uh, so we're not sure if there's a way to get them in or not, and if not, we 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 may have to find a couple more people. We have a vacant bedroom in a two bedroom, which we've had some difficulty filling um, for kind of the same reasons. Um, the so under the re the rental subsidy, they um, they meet the qualifications with a roommate, but we've had some um, difficulty. Um, with the uh, tax credit side, because they don't on the on the complexes side, they they don't um, they they make over what the the complexes cap is. So that's been something that's been a challenge as well. And then there's a question. I submitted an application for New Park Ave. When will I hear back if my son has been accepted? Do you know how recently it was um, submitted? Erin, maybe if you put your contact information yeah. in the chat, um, there could be some individual outreach. Sure. All right, um, it is at the 4.30 hour. I couldn't be more pleased um, with today's forum. I wanna sincerely thank uh, the pre presenters. Um, you. Um, each offered information that um, built on one another. And uh, um, I found uh, today's forum just really informative. 
and um, it really gave a, a, a picture of what supportive housing has to offer. And so I, I sincerely thank you. I see that people are putting their contact information in the chat and we will make sure that we add uh, your names um, to our distribution list so you will get a uh, notice of for future forums. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.